Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the LFPL's Zoom space. My name is Tony Dingman. I'm the program coordinator for the main library. I'd also like to, like to welcome you to this year's first My Library U short course, A Celebration of Failure. I'm really excited to introduce this particular program, um, particularly after the past couple of years that we've had. I feel like failure is, it's ubiquitous. We're all holding hands with it. And it's gonna be nice for over the next few weeks to kind of take it apart and maybe, I don't know, look at it from a different perspective. Um, if you did not get the course outline, we will have it available for you on the My Library U registration page online. So without further ado, I should introduce our um, tonight's guest. Uh, that is Dr. Jasmine Ferrier. This program is called Policy Failure, and you'll see why as she goes through it. She is the Vice President for Unity, University Advancement at the University of Louisville and former Chair of Political Science. She grew up in Brooklyn, New York, earned a BA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, both in political science, uh, both of them in political science. In 2002, Fer uh, Dr. Ferrier joined the Department of Political Science at the University of Louisville. In almost 20 years at University of Louisville, her courses and research have spanned all three branches of the US government, including a book on interbranch lawsuits, separation of powers, and constitutional law. Cornell University published recently, or in 2019, Constitutional Dysfunction on Trial, Congressional Lawsuits and the Separation of Powers, written by Dr. Ferrier. So if you would, please, uh, let's welcome Dr. Ferrier. Thank you, Tony. It is a, an honor and a delight to be with you and to be invited to begin this very interesting series. Thank you to everyone who is with us right now. I look forward to your questions and I will try to keep it lively. Luckily, the way Tony set up this program, the standards are pretty loose because who knows what might happen. I don't feel like I need to be perfect tonight. Is that right, Tony? You do not. This is a course on failure. So I know. And so I'm almost excited for something to go wrong, but I won't tempt the fates. My goal tonight is to spark a conversation, but not necessarily answer all the big questions about American constitutional government, American constitutional democracy, and where we are right now. My goal is to introduce the concept of failure as part of constitutional political and policy discourses. And what I mean by discourse is that ideas bounce through American politics in very interesting ways with trajectories that are sometimes hard to fathom and are hard to predict. So what I'll do tonight is deceptively simple, but I will bring you over the course of one plus a little bit of the last century, four lives, four different ideas, and four instances of failure. The late 1900s through today will be the basis of the discussion. I'm going to introduce to you four people. You probably have heard of them. One is Justice John Marshall Harlan from Kentucky, the lone dissenter in Plessy versus Ferguson. The second is anti-lynching crusader and journalist Ida B. Wells. The third is conservative politician, would-be presidential successful candidate if he had won, but later a senator and an elder statesman from Arizona, Barry Goldwater. The fourth is Representative Barbara Lee, still serving in the U.S. House, who had the lone vote in 2001 against the first authorization for the use of military force within one week of the 9-11 attacks. You don't have to agree with the ideas that all four of them espoused, but I think you'll find their stories interesting because they were failures. They were failures of policy and they were failures of communication. If you think that failure means that not everyone agrees with your idea, but if you think that we can be patient and the world can catch up with them, you'll be surprised how thoroughly their ideas were vindicated. So let's start with our first story. We'll travel more or less chronologically. Let's start with Justice John Marshall Harlan. So 
To keep things lively, I will be sharing my screen. I have lots of tabs and I will read from them. So I'm happy to share them at the end. And Tony has a copy of all of these links as well. Please note, I tried to use public domain and non-advertising websites as much as possible, but if something pops up, neither Tony nor I endorse it whatsoever. Let's talk about native Kentucky and John Marshall Harlan. You might notice that he was named in part after the great chief justice, not the first chief justice, but the great chief justice, John Marshall. John Marshall Harlan was born in Boyle County, Kentucky on June 1st, 1833. He was graduated from Center College in 1850 at the age of 17. Fun fact, next time you're in Danville, walk down Main Street, you might see some historical markers dedicated to John Marshall Harlan. Harlan studied law at Transylvania University for two years and read law in his father's law office. In 1853, he was admitted to the bar and began to practice law. In 1858, Harlan served for one year as Franklin County judge. He ran for the US House of Representatives in 1959, but was narrowly defeated. During the Civil War, Harlan joined the Union Army and served as an officer. In 1863, he resigned his commission and was elected Attorney General of Kentucky, serving for four years. He was a Republican candidate for governor in 1875, but President Rutherford B. Hayes instead nominated Harlan to the Supreme Court in 1877. The Senate confirmed the appointment and he was appointed at the same time, which may sound usual, in 1892 by President Benjamin Harrison to represent the US in arbitration with Great Britain over fishing rights over the Bering Sea. He served on the Supreme Court for 34 years, which is a tenure only exceeded by four other justices, and he died in 1911 at the age of 78. Maybe so far it doesn't sound that compelling. Well, it turns out he has a very interesting story. John Marshall Harlan came from a family of slave owners, although he of course fought for the Union during the Civil War. In a new book, although this is not necessarily new information, um, and I'll show you the book in just a moment. It was very well known by the family and by others that John Marshall Harlan had a half brother, an older half brother, his father's son, who was black. And Robert Harlan, who was considered a freed slave after the Civil War, had a very important part personally and professionally in his younger brother's life. So I'm not gonna be able to read all of this, but I do want you to know that his brother, Robert Harlan, again, who is considered to be his father's son, a black member of the family, although he was born into slavery um, in Harrisburg, Kentucky. Eventually though, as you'll see from, if you skim this Smithsonian Ar uh, Magazine article, he amassed a small fortune in a number of businesses, including in the gold rush. He was considered to be a political and um, policy force of nature, especially regarding black voting rights. And he had a lot of influential friends. What did all this mean for John Marshall Harlan? One of my favorite websites to go to for Supreme Court cases is called Oye, which is French for hear ye, hear ye, right? If you see the root word there. Oye is um, a website that is a university website but it has a lot of primary source information. So even though we're gonna to get to the Plessy case in just a moment, I would like to go over what is called the first civil rights cases, although the title might be misleading. Here are the facts of the case. Uh, after the Civil War, the Reconstructionist Congress passed what was called the Civil Rights Act of 1875, affirming the equality of all persons in the enjoyment of transportation facilities, hotels and inns, theaters and places of public amusement, Although privately owned, these businesses were like public utilities, exercising public functions for the benefit and thus subject to public regulation. In five separate cases, a black person was designed the same accommodation as a white person in violation of the 1875 Act. So I'd like to explain this a little bit. After the Civil War, the 14th Amendment says that no state shall deny to any person within its jurisdiction equal protection of the law nor denied to them due process of the law. The question then is, can Congress using the 14th Amendment regulate privately owned public accommodation? Again, like a hotel, a restaurant, a theater, a place where you need money to enter. It's not truly a public accommodation, but 
there should be no other barrier to being able to use this. The constitutional question, simply put, was did Congress violate the Constitution and the 14th Amendment by passing this type of integration legislation aimed at private businesses? By an eight to one decision, as you can see, differentiating between state and private action, the majority in this case ruled that the 14th Amendment did not permit the federal government to protect discriminatory behavior by private parties. Therefore, sections one and two of the Civil Rights Act of 1875 were unconstitutional because they exceeded Congress's authority under the 14th Amendment. Justice Harlan was the lone dissenter. He pointed to the public function of these private places of accommodation. Harlan argued that the line between state and private action is often blurred, such as how private railroads provide the government function of facilitating travel. He suggested that restrictions on the right to travel may violate the 13th Amendment prohibition against involuntary servitude and argued that the privileges and immunities clause of the 14th Amendment may also be implicated. In other words, Justice John Marshall Harlan was agreeing with Congress and against his eight colleagues by saying that Congress has the right to enforce the 14th Amendment through private business regulation. But much more famously, of course, he was again the lone dissenter in the landmark case of Plessy versus Ferguson. Here are the facts of this case. Louisiana had enacted the Separate Car Act, which required separate railway cars for blacks and whites. In 1892, Homer Plessy, who was considered to be one eighth black, agreed to participate in a test to challenge the act. So in other words, a lot of Supreme Court cases throughout the civil rights era from the late 1800s through the 1960s and beyond are sometimes test cases by activists who are trying to flout the law in order to challenge its constitutionality. That happened in this case when Homer Plessy who is technically black under the Louisiana law sat in a whites only car of a Louisiana train on purpose. Of course, the constitutional question is much simpler than that, which is can Louisiana pass a law that separates the races in public accommodations that are publicly regulated? And that would not only include transportation, but of course that would include public education. Although the phrase separate but equal is not exactly taken as a quote from this case, it is the effect of the case. And you can see with one justice not participating in a seven to one decision, Justice John Marshall Harlan is again, the lone dissenter. The court held that the Louisiana law was constitutional. In an opinion authored by Justice Henry Billings Brown, the majority upheld state imposed racial segregation. Justice Brown conceded that the 14th amendment is intended to establish absolute equality for the races, but held that separate treatment did not always imply the inferiority of African-Americans. In other words, segregation did not in itself constitute unlawful discrimination. In his dissent, famously, John Marshall Harlan argued that the constitution was colorblind, that was actually his word, and that the US had no class system and therefore all citizens should have equal access to civil rights. So one of the interesting features about the United States Supreme Court, and that is, this is part of the book that I want to plug, The Great Dissenter, The Story of John Marshall Harlan, which was recently published. But before we get back into the story of John Marshall Harlan, I would like to remind people that the Supreme Court, although it is often assumed to be the quote last word, is rarely the last word. There's nothing in the constitution that says that the Supreme Court should have the last word. And of course, we have plenty of historical pieces of evidence to show that it is not. I'll give you two cases, the civil rights cases. So in 1883, the Supreme Court said that Congress could not regulate private accommodations. Well, we know it took a very long time, but Congress did exactly that in 1964 through the Civil Rights Act. Among many other things, the Civil Rights Act legislated private businesses regarding interstate commerce. In other words, if a person was traveling interstate, they could not be denied restaurant or hotel accommodations. You couldn't be denied in a gas station, a movie theater, or in other areas that are privately owned where the only barrier is having money and a reservation to be accommodated. Again, in 1964, in effect, although they used a different constitutional argument, Congress told the, Constitution, Congress told the Supreme Court 
that it got the Constitution wrong and that John Marshall Harlan was correct. Going a little bit out of order chronologically, Plessy versus Ferguson was of course overruled in 1954 in Brown versus the Board of Education of Topeka, Kansas. In that case, which was unanimous, the Supreme Court argued that the very premise of segregation was inferiority, which was in violation of the 14th Amendment. What I'd like to add next is where is the story today? So again, I'm gonna do this for each of our four stories. I'm sure you, you may have some questions, but I promise I will get to them at the end of each of these sections. I hope that you can see my new screen, which is about January 5th, 2022. This is a very recent news development. Maybe you've seen it. This is from the office of the governor of the state of Louisiana. Today, Governor John Bell Edwards, this is January 5th of this year, took the historic action of signing Louisiana's first posthumous pardon of Mr. Homer A. Plessy, who was convicted of violating Louisiana's Separate Car Act of 1890, the purpose of which was to ensure racial segregation as a means to promote white supremacy. Governor Edwards was joined by descendants of Homer A. Plessy, Justice John Harlan, and Justice John Ferguson, I'm sorry, Judge John Ferguson, as well as Southern University Professor of Law, Angela Bell, and others, local elected officials. So this is a very, you might say, happy ending to a very complex and painful chapter for the United States as we confront the legacy of slavery, segregation, and racial hierarchy. I'm going to take a peek with a question. So we have a question. What does this have to do with failure? Very good question. What this has to do with failure is that John Marshall Harlan was the lone dissenter in two landmark cases, but ultimately his ideas were vindicated. So if eight to one and seven to one are not failures when you're on the Supreme Court and you're the one, I'm not sure what else it would be. What this is saying is that in his own day, he was a man who had ideas that failed in the public sphere. But later in the next century, those ideas were vindicated. I hope that questioner feels comfortable coming back with, a, with another follow-up. Let's move on. Ida B. Wells. Ida B. Wells is a famous African-American civil rights advocate, journalist, and feminist. She is considered an American hero by many. She was born enslaved in Holly Springs, Mississippi in 1862. She was the oldest daughter of James and Lizzie Wells. During Reconstruction, her parents were active in the Republican Party. Mr. Wells was involved with the Freedmen's Aid Society and helped start Rust College. Rust is an historically black liberal arts college and is affiliated with the United Methodist Church. Ida B. Wells had to drop out of school to support her family at 16 when she lost her parents. She moved, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. She became a famous journalist and the area that she was so eloquently writing about was about lynching specifically lynching of African-American men. In 1892, I'm going to skip through this, Wells turned her attention to anti-lynching after a friend and who, two of his business associates were murdered. The white store owner and his supporters clashed with her friends on multiple occasions, and this tragedy helped to inspire her to investigate other cases of lynching in which she turned the narrative of lynching on its head. Normally, I shouldn't say normally, but many times men were, African-American men were lynched because of allegations of sexual impropriety. And she argued in each of those cases that it was not at all the case at all. And that there were facts that bore out a reverse argument, which was that the men had often been victims themselves or had tried to protect other victims. In other words, the idea which I don't think we, we would classify as a failure, but in her time, Ida B. Wells was trying very hard to not just uncover through investigative reporting, but trying to push for legislation. That's where the failure, unfortunately, has to come in. So I'll read one more point and move to another area. Um, she was an active fighter for women's suffrage, and particularly for black women. Um, she was part of the 1913 famous suffrage parade where many black women had to walk in the back. 
And although she was awarded a Pulitzer Prize, she never saw her ideal piece of legislation enacted. I'm going to continue. And this is her book, Lynch Law in All Its Phases, Southern Horrors. Sorry about that. I'm going to move a little bit faster. So anti-lynching legislation, is this an example of failure? I'll anticipate that question. You tell me. Despite the fact that thousands of Black men are recorded to have been lynched, even between the, air, the years of 1901 and 1929, more than 1,200 African Americans were lynched in the South. Again, that's only between 1901 and 1929. And of course, there are many other documented cases. Why couldn't the US Congress pass anti-lynching legislation? And this is an article in the universe, I'm sorry, in the House of Representatives website that explains why anti-lynching legislation repeatedly failed. Now, when Republicans gained majorities, there were more there was more optimism. Of course, Republicans at the time were much more in favor of civil rights than Democrats in that time. And for example, um, various activists tried to pay visits to different representatives to try to get federal anti-lynching legislation passed. You may already know that it never did pass. And then I'm going to show you something that may surprise you, which is that to this day, there have been no anti-lynching legislation initiatives passed by both the House and the Senate. So before something is presented to the president, it has to pass through the House and Senate in identical form. So here, since 1900, the House and Senate have repeatedly failed to pass such a bill. This bill named, in, uh, by, named to honor the horrific victim of a, of a grisly murder, Emmett Till. Um, this bill is called the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act and it has not been passed in its exact form for the House and Senate to be able to present it to the president. So is this a continued failure in a sense, you would say yes, of course, and in a sense, you would say no. There is no anti-lynching legislation on the books for the United States. However, there is no question that the United States has progressed quite far on the area of Black civil rights. It still goes to show that it is very important for ideas to not always be done and that we have to figure out why we are still having this argument about anti-lynching legislation. On a lighter note, journalist Ida B. Wells has recently been commemorated with a Barbie doll for her fearless activism. And this is as recently as January 11th, 2022. Editor, journalist, anti-lynching activist and NAACP co-founder Ida B. Wells joins Pantheon of Distinguished Women honored by Mattel with her own signature Barbie doll. Here's a recent picture of members of her family. That's her great great, I'm sorry, her great granddaughter and other members of the family dedicated we're dedicating a monument to her. Ida B. Wells is definitely enjoying a resurgence, although her particular area of unrelenting activism, you might argue, was a failure. Again, bringing anti-lynching legislation. Now let's move on a little bit faster into the 20th century. Barry Goldwater. Barry Goldwater was an Arizonan and I'd like to read a little bit about him from his Senate biography. Barry Goldwater was born in Arizona in 1909, three years before Arizona became a state. He loved its rugged landscape and he would have been uh, something more of an adventurer had he not had to go work for his family's department store. In 1952, he, de he defeated a popular incumbent Senator, Ernest McFarlane, who happened to be the Senate Democratic majority leader. As a senator, Barry Goldwater proposed a new and sometimes even in his own day, radical agenda. He preached the cause of modern conservatism, wrote one biographer, emphasizing individualism, the sanctity of private property, anti-communism, and the dangers of centralized power. Before long, the freshman senator moved into the ranks of the leadership, becoming the chair of the Republican Campaign Committee in 1955. In 1960, with the publication of what is now known to be a ghost written book, not written by him, but written by um, a brother-in-law of a famous commentator on the Republican side, um, with the publication of The Conscience of the Conservative, again, 
ghost written, but still attributed to Barry Goldwater, he became a leader of a national movement. Written with speechwriter Brent Fozell, the book was a statement of Goldwater's political creed. In chapters that focused on civil rights, labor relations, and the welfare state, Goldwater called for, quote, the utmost care and vigilance, I'm sorry, the utmost vigilance and care to keep political power within its proper bounds. The book was largely dismissed, but a very interesting movement began, began to swell around Goldwater and conservative ideas because of a backlash that was brewing against the New Deal and then against the Great Society programs of Lyndon Johnson. So if you think about the hegemony of liberal ideas that took hold in the United States, starting in the first election of Franklin Roosevelt in 1932, the idea that more of the private sector could be regulated by the federal government. And then in the 1960s, the idea that private behavior, including, as we said earlier, private behavior regarding discrimination in private property, that would have a very important expansion on the federal government. So Barry Goldwater, of course, ran for the presidency in 1964. And as you can see, there are lots of examples here where the Southern strategy, meaning the idea of the white South voting for Republican was still very radical at that time. The white South was more or less um, going to be democratic for almost a hundred years after the civil war. And it was interesting to note, although this was not the first time, but it is unique to see that Southern states were beginning to warm up to the Republican party beginning in 1964. Here's the electoral map of 1964. As you can see, 486 electoral votes for Lyndon Johnson and the rest for Barry Goldwater. He won his home state of Arizona and he also won the former Confederate states of Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, Georgia, and South Carolina. Is this failure? Most people would say yes. If you looked at a landslide like this, you would be pretty hard pressed to say that anything positive would come out of being on the losing end of 486 electoral votes for your, the other side. However, if you know anything about conservative politics, you might know that something very famous happened in 1964. In support of Barry Goldwater was Ronald Reagan, who of course was himself a former Democrat, a former union activist, former governor of California, becoming a very staunch conservative who backed Barry Goldwater and gave a speech called A Time for Choosing. Among conservatives, this is called the speech. People who followed Ronald Reagan's career knew that this speech would launch him eventually into a political career and the presidency, which he ultimately won in 1980. I'd like to quote a little bit about from the book called Legacies of Losing in American Politics, which I'll discuss more. Explaining Goldwater. Had Goldwater conformed to the standard political science description of a politician, a rational and ambitious office seeker, conservatives may not have had to develop an organizational capacity, nor mobilize as they did to convince him of the existence of their support. Had he been a rationally behaving office seeker, Goldwater would have also adopted moderate positions and thus would not have spurred conservative supporters to sustained action. And while their efforts cost Goldwater the election, they created an organizational infrastructure and the grassroots ideological support for that structure that could last beyond their candidate. The energy organization and technological campaign innovations of 1964 first developed to recruit Goldwater's leadership became crucial to Republican candidate success in future elections up to the present. Is the modern day Republican party an ideological child of failed presidential candidate, Barry Goldwater? Many people would say yes. Let's go to the second question. The second person said, um, Interesting so far, not sure where the session is heading. Um, what wonder what makes these unique examples. In history, many ideas were not picked up. And for those who advocated for those ideas, they probably had strong convictions. Good point. 
Ah, another person, Mark, thank you for saying this. I thought you were going to mention Ida Barnett, who's that, that Ida B. Wells is married name. Bravery not to give up her train seat long before staging media coverage, but because of her rights. Thank you for mentioning that, Mark. That is absolutely true. Among many of her achievements was to have the ability to be arrested. Of course, this is long before Rosa Parks. Ida B. Wells was, was arrested and forcibly taken off of the train. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that. So where is it, does all this lead us so far? Um, I chose these examples because I thought that they represented ideas that um, an audience would find compelling. There are many more examples out there. And as Tony knows, I wrestled with a few other ones as well. This is just meant to be a snapshot to help us understand that as we live in a moment right now where some ideas may be very unpopular, we have to make sure that we have politicians and movements that have infrastructure to articulate them and that those ideas and movements later have perhaps a new life of their own and they can be successful. So let's go to our next and last example. This is one that may really resonate with people who have been paying close attention to the war efforts of the United States over the past two decades. Oh, I also wanted to mention one more thing about Goldwater. William Rehnquist, of course, was the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He passed away, and John Roberts is now the Chief Justice. But William Rehnquist was beginning his career working for Barry Goldwater. And that actually haunted the career of William Rehnquist, and it dogged him at every step of the way as he became a judge and then a Supreme Court associate judge, justice, and then when he was appointed to be the chief. Um, so again, we don't want to pretend that it's easy to be on the losing side of an argument or that those are without risk. And I'm not saying you'd have to agree or disagree with any of this, but that William Rehnquist always had to answer to the fact that he supported fellow Arizonan Barry Goldwater and worked for his campaign. Um, I'm citing quite a bit of this information from a book called Legacies of Losing in American Politics. And there are other examples in this book, but there's a whole chapter on Barry Goldwater that um, I'm going to be quoting from here. I strongly recommend this book. Now let's talk about um, a contemporary politician. Her name is Barbara Lee, and she is a Democrat from Texas. I may have said, um, California, but I think I may have misspoken there. Um, she is from California now, but she's originally from Texas. Just want to make sure I clear that up. Congresswoman Barbara Lee. She was born in segregated El Paso, Texas and attended St. Joseph's Catholic School. Um, she moved to San, Fr San Fernando and in California and worked for the local NAACP to integrate her high school cheerleading squad. As a single mother of two sons, she attended Mills College, received public assistance while building a better life. This is according to her official biography, according to the House of Representatives. The first, um, as president of Mills College Black Student Union, she invited Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, the first African-American woman elected to Congress to vote for the first time and worked on Congressman Chisholm's historic presidential campaign, including serving as her delegate in the 1972 Democratic National Convention. Moving along, um, she was a staffer for Congressman Dellums, and she founded a facilities company. In 1990, she was elected to the California State Assembly. And in 1998, she was elected to serve California's ninth district, which is now the 13th after redistricting in a special election. This is the point I'd like to make. In 2001, one week after the attacks of 9-11, Congresswoman Lee received national attention as the only member of Congress to oppose the authorization for the use of military force. And that was the first AUMF, not the, the second one. The first one was against the Taliban and it was, it's still in effect and it's been used to go to, oh, well over a dozen other countries in the name of the United States to prevent and punish terroristic attacks. The second AUMF was, was, of course, against Iraq. That is also still in effect, but that is a different authorization for the use of military force, and she was not the sole person who voted against it. 
In 2001, con the Congresswoman believed that this AUMF would become a blank check for endless war. As of 2013, and this is obviously way out of date, the authorization has been used more than 30 times to engage in military action without congressional oversight. She is still working to repeal this legislation and she's become much more popular on both sides of the aisle as she works for that cause. For example, she was the only member of Congress, this is according to the Washington Post and some called her a traitor. I'm not sure if we'll be able to listen to the whole video, but I'd like to introduce a bit of it. Dr. Ferrier, I think we're having trouble hearing it. So you may need to. Okay, sure. Well, if you can um, at least read the captions maybe, are you able to see the captions? We are. Okay, well, I, I just wanna make sure that you, you read the rest of it then. Well, that's going, Dr. Ferrier. Uh, is there a button at the bottom that says something about audio? Mm, okay, well, that's all right. I'll just stop sharing it for now. Um, what I wanted you to see and hear, and you can certainly look at this video, uh, Barbara Lee. This is again, September of 2001. Um, what she is trying to say is that she knows she's alone. She accepts that she will say these things and not be popular. She of course was going to be threatened both politically and physically for her one vote against the authorization for the use of military force. But was she entirely wrong? And what have we learned in the lessons of the longest wars in American history that have begun after 9-11? Again, there's much more of a movement now to repeal and possibly replace the AUMF. And there have been more Republicans who are coming around to this argument as well as Democrats. Remember, she was a lonely voice even on the Democratic side if you think about presidential contenders and would-be contenders who also voted in favor of the war, and I'm talking about John Kerry, John Edwards, Hillary Clinton, and Joe Biden, all of whom voted on the other side with Barbara Lee, but she may have much more interest and sway with some members of the Democratic Party today, and again, some libertarian-minded Republicans on winding down the longest war in American history. That's the book that she's recently been promoting. What I'd like to do at the end of this is talk about a book that has influenced me quite a bit and it's called The Democratic Constitution. And although it's not about failure, and here's a copy of the book and the table of contents, it talks about the ways in which ideas bounce around the political system and bounce through all three branches and the states. And that ideas are complicated in American history. You don't strike gold with an idea and make it stick. It's very important to be persistent and to have a coalition. And these are some of the lessons of failure that I hope we can discuss a little bit further tonight. With that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I wanna thank everyone for being attentive and for asking good questions. If you have a question um, that, that was not posted to us, um, you are welcome to uh, raise your hand or add a question to the question answer at the bottom at this moment. Um, 
and really most anything's fair game at this point. We're we're uh, our, our conversation is about things that didn't work but do work later, or perhaps not giving up at the um, in in sight of difficult time. Does anyone have any questions? You can also raise your hand. I should be able to, if you raise your hand, see it and then um, give you audio permission as well. If anyone would like to say anything. I have some, th there's some thanks in there for you. I know I'm reading that. Thank you both. <laughs> Thank you, anonymous and attendee one and anonymous attendee two. I appreciate your, uh, your positivity. Uh, again, I'm, I'm very happy to answer challenging questions too um, about why I chose these examples and um, any facts that I may have overlooked or missed that are relevant to these four stories. So again, going back to John Marshall Harland, Ida B. Wells Barnett, um, Barry Goldwater, and Barbara Lay. I have a question. Um, how frequently was um was the Supreme Court, John Marshall, how frequently was he on the opposite side of the majority? Was that mm -hmm. something that was consistent and he was in what he did? I, I wish I could give you an answer, but I don't know because um, that would take a little bit more research to look at his entire 30 plus year career. I, I would plug the book, The Great Dissenter. I'm sure it has a lot more information. I just wanted to focus on two of his most famous dissents, but it's a wonderful question. And I wouldn't want to make a, the wrong guess, but thank you for asking. And so sure. again, The Great Dissenter is the book that is going to be the best source to look at all of his decisions, I'm sure. And can I ask you again as well, in your research, um, were there any particular, and you don't, you don't have to actually you know, mm -hmm. take them off the top of your head, but were there any particular quotes or, or statements by any of these people that you found to be um, moving in regards to, you know, being at, at, at odds with the majority? Was there anything in particular that struck you? A absolutely. Um, if you think about, let's go, start from the beginning, Justice John Marshall Harlan saying that the Constitution is colorblind, which is in itself a very contestable statement because the Constitution was written to include three clauses that protected slavery where it existed. So that concept of being colorblind is often contested, not just as a factual question in his own day, but also as a statement of an ideal world. And I think that many scholars and people who have noticed the rhetoric of racial reckoning in the United States don't always agree that colorblind is the goal. So it's interesting that that phrase has been echoed. Of course, it's probably not original to him, but it's quite significant that he used that phrase to describe the Constitution in 1896. Um, for Ida B. Wells, it's hard to choose what part of her story is the most inspiring um, as a self-sufficient woman who's fighting both for Black men's rights and for women's voting rights, especially African-American women who were excluded by the 15th Amendment and would have to fight to be included in the suffrage movement for the 19th Amendment. Um, as one of the commenters said, I mean, she really did put her body on the line for the, the things that she believed in, which is something that we may all think in theory that we would be courageous enough to do, but we are often rarely called upon to make that decision and threaten ourselves, our family, our security, our livelihood. And she did all of those things. For Barry Goldwater, I think it does take a certain amount of bravery, even if his ideas were very controversial in their own time and now, to take a stand against the ideological hegemony of the New Deal, which turned a page on a very traditional view of American capitalism that would be regulated at the individual or the state level. Again, it's hard to overstate the way that Franklin Roosevelt's four elected terms, he of course died in his fourth term, but Harry Truman and then even Dwight Eisenhower continued much of the legacy of Franklin Roosevelt. We still live in Roosevelt's world. That's how dramatically we shifted towards federal regulation of otherwise previously understood private economic decisions. Think about the fact that Social Security and aid to families as dependent children were invented in 1935. We have to think about the regulation again, of the manufacturer and the labor rights of workers that all come from the New Deal, 
when we think of the New Deal, we think of building bridges, schools, railroad tunnels, but there's an idea that starts to take hold that is still contested. And even if they don't know it, a lot of conservatives today are indirectly echoing the objections of Barry Goldwater that were again successfully articulated by Ronald Reagan. And to people who quote Reagan as the beginning of a revolutionary movement, I think it's more accurate to say that Barry Goldwater does deserve a lot of the idea success that Reagan later perfected for his two victories as president in 80 and 84. Of course, Barbara Lee, we're living in the world that Barbara Lee was trying to convince us to reject. Again, the longest words in American history, I encourage people to go to the project that it's called the cost of war project at Brown University. The cost of war project is a scholarly project that looks at the number of dollars spent in the past 20 years. It looks at the number of lives lost both from the United States and from the places that we have invaded and bombed. It looks at the cost of caring for veterans. It looks at the cost of the human toll of refugees. And it's a very sobering reminder that Barbara Lee stood up and said, all of these things may happen. And again, she was not only lonely, but she was ridiculed and even threatened. Those are all inspiring to me. So what you're saying is that, that despite the, the fact that it looks like Barbara Lee's work is still, still un, perhaps unfinished, the, the, and some might call failure, that it is, her legacy that is a success? Is that? Well, it's not. It's still not a success. I mean, we have not yeah. repealed either of those war resolutions. But if you look at the odd bedfellows that have started to rally around the concept of repealing the two authorizations for the use of military force, they do include more libertarian minded Republicans who are largely small government, which includes small war government. And I do think that if the Democrats and Republicans work together to create a bipartisan repeal bill, it, that President Biden would sign it. It doesn't mean that it would clip the wings of presidential war powers, which as Barbara Lee herself said, presidents can act in emergencies and certainly in defensive postures without Congress. But the unpopular Vietnam War was wound down in part because Congress repealed the authorization called the 1964 Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. The Gulf of Tonkin Resolution expanded presidential power. It expanded the war from Vietnam to Cambodia and Laos. There were student protests against that. Kent State is a reminder that the protesters who were killed in Kent State were not protesting the Vietnam portion of the Vietnam War, but the Cambodian invasion. And Eventually, Congress did fight back, and Nixon did have to wind the war down. And of course, we are still debating what we learned in Vietnam. So I think Barbara Lee um, will have an obituary eventually. I mean, maybe not for a long time, hopefully, but that will be the first line will be about her lonely vote in 2001. Who among us would have the courage one week after 9-11 to cast that vote and make that speech? So one of the questions I see is, um, thank you, Lacey, are there any narratives to talk about how these individuals coped with their failures? I do not have any insight into that. It's a great question. I really couldn't imagine how to answer it other than we'd have to look at their uh, at biographies and autobiographies and much more writing rather than this um, rather superficial overview. I really do think that it's a lonely life. I think that if you look at other civil rights heroes, let's say James Meredith, who integrated the University of Mississippi in 1962, there's a famous line that, um, that really struck me when I've watched Eyes on the Prize, which is the prize-winning documentary series. There, there are two versions of it. I'm talking about the 1986 version. In episode two of Eyes on the Prize, there's a segment about James Meredith. And Merle Evers, who was Medgar Evers' widow, described James Meredith as a very lonely person. He was lonely and he was scared and he was afraid to reveal weaknesses and he had to have a stoic demeanor, a very cold demeanor, Merle Evers described it as. So no, I can't imagine what it's like to have 
any semblance of a normal family, normal social life, a normal job, when you're alone in your ideas. That's just a guess. There's another question as well. Did any of these individuals, with the exception of Barbara Lee, live to see their failed ideas vindicated? Hmm. That's a very interesting question. Uh, I don't think these four examples. Um, let's find out. I'm going to do a quick check. Barry Goldwater died. in 1998. So I would say he is probably unique in that while he never served as president, he did serve in the Senate long enough to see his ideas vindicated by a resurgent Republican movement. And again, Republican and conservative are not necessarily the same. I, I would definitely caution against that. But I do think that Barry Goldwater living until the late 1990s saw President Reagan win two terms, saw President Bush, the first President Bush win one term. He lived long enough to see the House of Representatives flip from Democrat to Republican under the leadership of Newt Gingrich, which is hard to imagine that it took the Republicans out of the wilderness where they had been for over 40 years. So when Newt Gingrich won as a Republican conservative in 1994 to bring the House to the Republican majority, it had been 40 years since Republicans last held the House. And now it doesn't seem like the Democrats are able to hold on to the House for much longer. And it's become a much more contested area of American political institutional life. I'm eager for more questions. Thank you again, Mark. I see another comment. Mark says, loved your examples. Ida B. Wells has been a heroine since I learned about her. Thanks to FDR for appointing Francis Perkins, the genius behind safe work conditions, limited employment, limiting employers, uh, sorry, employees to eight hours a day and to social security. And I think Mark also agrees with the inclusion of Barbara Lee. Again, there were so many interesting subjects for this talk. I, I'd like to turn the tables, Tony, if I may. You do it. So um, with our remaining time, I'd love to hear from the audience. If you were me, who would you have chosen? You can put it in the questions or in the you chat. You can put it in the chat, yeah. Yeah, or Tony, while people are thinking about it, who would you have chosen? Who would I have chosen historically? Who was a or from? It could be from entertainment, from literature. Oh from goodness gracious! Anything. Who who should be the failures? Who lead us into thinking about things we think we understand in a new way? Who go oh. against the grain? Wow. The, um, Abraham Lincoln. Good. You, I mean, I would imagine that many people would point to Abraham Lincoln consistently as someone who had to had to had to move against tremendous odds and he was thrown obviously as we all know into some pretty rough waters to begin with as as president um i'm gonna Absolutely. give that some thought i see there's abraham lincoln in the um in the chat okay can well. i um can i show while we're getting more answers in, I would like to, if I may, show some one more electoral college map that I think would be quite interesting. So let's turn the tables. Sometimes if we're saying that losers can become winners later, can it be the opposite too? Can a winner become a loser? I teach American presidency at UofL and it never fails to shock my students when they look at the 1972 electoral map. Do you see that on your screen? That is the year of the Watergate burglary and Nixon defeated McGovern with 520 electoral votes. Is that a winner or a loser? Nixon looks like a winner, except two years later, he'll be resigning the first time and so far only time that a president has resigned the presidency 
in the face of an inevitable impeachment and removal. So remember, we've just gone through two impeachments, but no removal because removal is a constitutional process that requires two thirds vote of the Senate. And Nixon was confronted by Republicans who told him that he was not going to survive. He resigned instead of being impeached. He's not an impeached president. And he resigned so that he could avoid not only certain impeachment, but certain conviction. And look at the win that he had two years before. It makes us wonder if we should stop thinking about winning as a forever concept. So that's just an interesting twist. So Chris is telling us, uh, I'm sorry, Heather talked about Maya Angelou having an amazing life with many obstacles. Einstein, Chris says, failed to link general relativity with quantum mechanics, but where would we be without his accomplishments? Um, I don't know a lot about this, but a non-US example, one of the anonymous attendees say, um, is the great emu war that the Australian government waged. It's an interesting episode. Well, I think we've all learned something tonight. We will be Googling the great emu war shortly. That's, I'm so happy that you were able to, um, to, to teach us something tonight. I'm, I'm gonna throw in there, and again, I don't, I don't know how you, anyone would feel about this as failure. Um, one, of my, one of my idols when I was young was Dr. Carl Sagan. Um, and he was kind of instrumental in starting the, the SETI, which is Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence out in the universe. And of course, we haven't found, as far as I know, um, and, and I think you would argue that perhaps that's, uh, that could be considered a failure in that they did not, you know, they didn't find anything. We haven't found anything yet, I suppose. But the number of uh, the amount of cute computing powder power and the number of of minds that have um, directed i think our gaze towards the universe i would say that's a success that certainly is helpful um you know in, in creating a larger interest in the universe around us maybe that's esoteric i don't know that's my thought i think that's fascinating um, I'm sorry that I see that some people have to leave early and I'm happy to wrap this up early if there are no more questions. Tony, I did see in the chat that there are some questions about how to access the information. So maybe you can wrap up with some of those suggestions, both for the books. Oh, and, yes. Um, and I other be, ways to access the material. Yeah, I will be sharing first, uh, this has been recorded. So this particular video um, will go up and let me start my video so you're not just listening to a disembodied voice. Uh, hello. Uh, this video will go up on YouTube, should go up on YouTube. Uh, it has to process and then we have to do some edits and put in names and things and titles um, within the next couple of days. And as far as the, the links and information um, that has been shared with me by Dr. Ferrier and I can share it with you in fact. I have all the emails of people who attended today, so I will send it out in the email tomorrow. Um, there, I, I'm everything that you shared with me, correct, Dr. Ferrier, is is what you wanted to share with. Right. Me. So it's just it's an inelegant list of links that I found that I used when I was clicking across my tabs. Of course, there are an infinite number of other resources, both in the public domain and that are under some advertising firewalls. But I, I do hope that most of these are accessible. And if you can't open one of them, you can find something similar somewhere else. So for example, if you're looking at the Reagan speech, there are lots of places where you can access that, including the Ronald Reagan Library, the Miller Center for Presidential Speeches. And the same goes for the others. I do encourage people who look at the OEA site, which you can do for any interesting court case that's a called a landmark. You can read a lot of those cases for yourself. What I showed you was a summary of the case, but if you really look at the website, you'll see links to the actual court decisions, including the majority opinion and the dissenting opinion. So I encourage everyone to get uncomfortable first by digging into court decisions and trying to read them for yourself. And then you become more comfortable as you get used to these sites. 
Oh, there are a lot of nice people here, Tony, saying lovely things. Thank you all. It, it was really a pleasure to put this idea together with Tony's encouragement. And I look forward to having another opportunity to continue the discussion. So if there aren't any more questions, um... Well, uh, uh, I was just looking at the great emu. I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Uh, Tell us, what is this? What is this emu war? All right. If that particular person would like to, to um, give me their name, I can, I can give them access to speak if they'd like. Meanwhile, I want to say thank you to those who are saying thank you to spend time with us. It is truly an honor to be in such an intellectual community. Thank you. So what I'm going to do, what I'd like to do now is just remind you uh, of the upcoming programs that I mentioned earlier. We have the Black History film series coming up throughout uh, February on Sundays at 1.30. And there's some, there's, we start, as I said, with 12 Years a Slave. And then we have a documentary about Tulsa within the next week. It's a PBS documentary. And then we have Green Book, and then we end with The Last Black Man in San Francisco, um, which is a, a wonderful movie about gentrification and, and art. And, um, oh, there's one more. Heather Burns says, another failure in history, women were first admitted to Girton College in 1869, but not until 1948 were they awarded degrees, not for lack of accomplishments, but yeah. Terrible. Um, so if no one else has any questions, thank you very much, Dr. Ferrier, for your time. You're welcome. And I look forward to seeing you next week, hopefully in person. And we'll have uh, Larry Horn and, as I said, that panel of three entrepreneurs who will be speaking of their own failures in, oh, some of the film series. Yes, uh, I just look at Chambers is asking. Uh, Will the film series be in person? Yes, it will be at the main library in the Centennial Room, which is down in the basement. If you've been to the to the, music, to the library, I used to work in a museum, so I say music. I want to say museum all the time. Yeah, downstairs, we kind of block out some of the windows so you can see a little better, and the screen's better down there. Um, and yes, so next week is Larry Horn and business failure. That should be fascinating, and then we move on from there. So thank you all very, very much. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Dr. Ferrier. You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Tony, for inviting me. It's been really a pleasure for me. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. You too. Thank you.